Morning, everyone. My name is Pasquale Didiana. I'm from Chicago. I was born in 1984. My family's been in the restaurant business since way before I was born. My grandfather on my mother's side had a little grill, a little breakfast place, 10 stools that overlooked the, the grill. My grandmother, they were separated. She owned a catering banquet hall, uh, two actually at two different points. On my father's side, my grandfather was a welder. He wasn't in the restaurant business, but he had seven sons. So he put them to work. He welded together a food truck back in Chicago and uh, painted three brothers on the side of it and put the kids to work throughout the streets of Chicago selling hot dogs and Italian beef sandwiches. When I was born, my father owned a breakfast restaurant. Um, that's where I took my first steps. Ever since I can remember, uh, I've been in the restaurant business. That's all I know. So when my parents moved to Italy when I was eight years old, um, it was kind of a shock. He took up everything that they, that they had, all their investments, and they moved to Italy because they fell in love with the Italian culture and they wanted to raise their children in a certain way. At that point, it was me, my brother, and my little sister. So my dad did, he made a big, big mistake that I don't want anybody in this room to make, is he had restaurant experience, and when he went to Italy with this money to invest, he decided to get into a leather manufacturing company with a partner. So long story short, from eight years old to 12 years old, I lived in Italy. About when I was 10 years old, his partner took off with all their cash assets to Brazil. No one ever heard from him again. So we were left in Italy stranded with no money in a one-bedroom apartment. Small one-bedroom apartment, may I say. Literally, my sofa bed that I shared with my brother and my sister was almost touched the kitchen sink. We didn't have a dining room table. We ate on a coffee table. And that was life growing up. So mom and pop hit some tough times. Um, I remember vividly, and this is going to come back in the presentation, the day I found out that Santa Claus did not exist. Okay. It was Christmas morning, it was me, I never shared this story by the way, it was me, my little brother, my little sister, we woke up excited that Santa Claus uh, had come, we saw the gifts, I picked the biggest gift up, my brother and my sister were so happy, and it said my name on it, Pasquale. So I unwrapped the gift, and at the time it was a big, uh, G.I. Joe was popular, it was this big G.I. Joe toy, and I was very, very happy. As I inspected the box, I saw a tag that said, from Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary. I was young, I was young, but I deciphered that situation so fastly, you know. Things had become so rough that my parents had to re-gift a gift sent from the U.S. to us kids so that we could have something to open up on Christmas morning. I tell you this because each and every one of you needs to figure out what motivates you and what's in your heart. We're going to start off with this before we get into any of the technical stuff. How many people own restaurants here? Good. How many people are thinking about opening up a restaurant? Great. Okay. <clears throat> the dream, what's in your heart? Dare to believe that good things are possible when you follow your heart. Does anybody know what their dream is? Yes, you in the back, sir. Yes. What's your dream? The what about it? What, do you want to know? what is your dream? Here's what I want you guys to work on, okay? Do not overthink or be logical about this, and I want you to think big and reach for the stars. So don't tell yourselves that my dream is to own a restaurant. You need to be way bigger than that, right? Is it owning a restaurant and then closing it after a year? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good, that's better. Anybody else want to share their dream? Yes, sir. Retire in 10 years. Okay, that's a dream. Good. Anybody else? Financial independence. Financial independence. Okay, that's a good one too. So I got no rock stars in this room, huh? No. Yes. I like to, I like to 
What was that? Okay, this guy wants to go national, right? You don't want one store. Good, good. You want to own your own chain. What's your name? Huh? Get up. Stand up. I want to hear your dream out loud. Say it again. Uh huh. Good. You see what I'm saying, guys? Financial in the. Yes. Are you raising your hand? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought I said. <laughs> yeah. Be more specific. Be more specific. Well, I think so if you asked me two years ago, I had the dream of franchising my brand mm -hmm. and going national. Okay. I'm a part of an entrepreneur's organization with a bunch of other franchisors throughout the country, throughout the world, and I was part of their forum for a year to learn from their experiences on what it's going to take to get to $100 million or whatever it is. Because mm -hmm. everyone's got different thresholds. Right. But financial system within its means, right? Absolutely. And to me, it's more of a quality of life. What I have to give up today to get to $100 million is not worth my time to give up the next 10 years when my kids are transitioning from high school to college. I plan to tailgate like every weekend. All right. <laughs> we're going to get back to this. I like, I like where this is going. After in the Q&A, we're going to have a lot of time to talk. I don't want to... I mean, I love where you're going because... That's good, though. You got it. He knows what I'm talking about. Good. So dare to believe that good things are possible when you follow your heart. Okay? Who came to Vegas to play? Nobody, right? You guys came to win. No one came to play. If you guys came to play, you wouldn't be here at 9 a.m. Right? You guys would be still out. This guy with the hair right here, right? You know? It was hard going to bed last night knowing you had to wake up, right? <laughs> in this city. Out of all cities, they decide to have this expo in Las Vegas. No, but we all came here to win. We didn't come to Vegas to come play around, right? We could come to Vegas whenever we want to play. We all came to win. Every, each one of you has a dream. I don't know how big, how small your dream is, but everyone here has a dream. Or we wouldn't be standing here at 9 a.m. in Las Vegas. All right, so do not overthink or be logical about your dream. You need to think big and reach for the stars. The reason I say this, guys, is a lot of times, and this is where he went already because he's a couple steps ahead of everyone, is that we think and we dream with our minds, right? One of my best friends growing up after high school, he went to college to get his accounting degree, became a CPA, spent eight years in college. The guy was the most miserable guy I ever met, making a great living, working all the time, Hated numbers, to please his parents, became an accountant to CPA. Fast forward now, he quit, his pre he quit uh, the accounting business, he became a fireman, and he does construction on the side. The guy is the happiest guy ever and does very, very well for himself. That's the example I'm going to give you guys. Do not dream with your minds, right? Do not dream with your minds. Dream with your heart. Learn to listen to your heart, to that voice inside and what it's telling you. Don't go be a CPA or an accountant to please anybody else if you hate that. You know, so many times in life we do what we think is the right thing or what someone tells us is the right thing, and we ignore what's deep down inside, what we really, really, really want. So let's learn to listen to our heart and to dream big, and then eventually we could pass it down to here and figure out how we're going to get there, like the gentleman in the white jacket, right? You guys can't tell I'm not good with this PowerPoint, so I apologize if I keep on going back and forth. Right. Be specific, you know, with your dream. Is it earning what you're earning now but being your own boss? Some people want that. I can see the value in that, right? Is it earning six figures? Anybody make six figures in here? Anybody want to make six figures in here? Everybody, right? Good. Is it making a million dollars? Anybody want to be a millionaire? How about being able to put your kids through college? That's a dream. Building your dream home. It's one of my dreams. How about leaving a legacy for future generations? Yeah, huh? that'd be nice. Your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids. Building something that lasts and leaving a legacy for multiple generations. That's a dream, right? That's a big, hairy, audacious dream. That's what we got to do. If you want one store, multiple stores, then the next big national chain, right? That's got to be a dream. The guy in the back with the hat, what was your name again? See? 
Yamani, he wants 100 million, he said, right? He wants to go national. Good. What does it mean for me and my family if my dream came true? Now I want you guys to start visualizing. Start visualizing and picture yourself walking in your own shoes if your dream were to come true. Yamani, what would your life be like if you made $100 million and, you, and your concept went national? Be different, right? Okay. Start picturing that. How would your life change? From now until your dream came true, how would your life change? Really get specific, guys, and start picturing all this, okay? You need to learn how to visualize stuff. Positive visualization is a strong, 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 powerful tool, and I'll share a lot of my stories with that, too, after we're done with this presentation. Make your dream sacred. Anybody in here ever have a dream, and you share it with someone, and they kind of shit on you? Yeah? Good, I'm not the only one. Anybody want to share their story? About that? That's fuel. That's fuel. There you go. That's fuel. I like that. So you need to protect it like a fragile baby, because that's your dream, right? If I want to open up a restaurant, and I got Johnny and Frankie down the block telling me that I'm crazy because no one's going to come eat my food, and 20 years go by, and I don't open up that restaurant, that's on me, right? I have to sit with that regret every day of my life for the next 20 years. Anybody ever make a decision that ate at them over and over and over as years gone by? Anybody live with that regret? I would rather do something, I would rather have the balls to make a choice and make a decision and fail than not do something at all. Because I can live with that. And I promise you guys, you'll be able to too. Don't listen to Johnny, don't listen to Frankie. You guys need positive reinforcement, reach out to me, okay? Find the people in your life that are willing to give you emotional support. This is so important, I would never have done nothing had I not met my wife 10 years ago. She was all the emotional support in the world that I needed till this day. She's my best friend, my worst enemy, but always, always, always giving me emotional support. She's in the front row right now. Why is emotional support, sorry, why is emotional support important? Huh? It keeps you going, right? It keeps you going. You need someone in your corner. Where can we find emotional support? If we're lucky, family and friends. If we're lucky and we're, and we're blessed, family and friends. But sometimes not everybody's that lucky. So we need to find those people in our lives that are willing to support us, okay? To support our dreams. And if someone doesn't, like I said, protect that dream, just like a little bubble, like a little baby. You gotta X that out of your life. Or you don't talk to those people about your dreams and your ambitions. So I'm gonna share something else with you guys. And this is the reason why some people don't wanna emotionally support you. Most people don't want you to do good. Most people do not want you to do good, or at least they don't want you to do better than them. That's a fact of human nature. Most people do not want you to do well, or at least not as good as them. So we need to find those people in our lives that propel us to move forward and to do better. Small people do small things and want other people to do small things. Big people do big things and want other people to do big things. Find those people in your life that will emotionally support you through anything and hold on to them. Don't ever take them for granted. What motivates you? Finding your why. Does anybody know why they do what they do? Passion, okay. Sir, why do you want to be financially free? Or independent, I'm sorry. Because I guess at an early age, you know, when I was doing what you were saying, the corporate job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so fast forward 20 years ago, that's later, I think I'm at that point, and, and my why right now is bringing my staff that don't have that experience that are 
15, 10-year government is given that same opportunity. Right. So what, are, and what, I, what I see is the, I try to experience, to give them the experience that I've been able to, to go through so they have the same opportunity. Good. So guys, once we find out what our dream is, we need to find out, we'll put it there. Right? We need to find out, we'll put it there. Why is that so important to know your why? Why? Uh-huh. Beautiful, that's a dream. We're getting somewhere now. See, that 100 million dream you have is a little... Now you're getting somewhere, you know? Here's my point with the why too, guys, you know? You need to find what's in your heart and then you need to find out why it's there. Because shit is gonna get tough. You guys wanna own restaurants or the guys that own restaurants will tell you, this stuff is not easy. So you better figure out what your dream is. If the restaurant business is part of your dream, figure out why and you gotta hang on to that why throughout this whole process. Because shit is gonna get rough. Um, how do I know if my why is enough? Okay, here are some rules. Will it make me jump out of bed? Anybody ever been so passionate about something they could barely sleep? Yeah, good. Your why is strong enough when it will make you jump out of bed and it will keep you up at night, when you're sleeping three, four hours. You can't go to bed because that's all you can think about and you're jumping out of bed because you're, you're so excited to do something. Does it bring tears to my eyes and touch my soul when I speak it out loud? That is how specific and powerful your why needs to be. Does it bring tears to my eyes and touch my soul when I speak it out loud? I told you guys my why, right? Or what drives me. I don't want my kids to ever have to worry about Santa. I don't want my kids to find out Santa Claus doesn't exist for a long, long time. I don't want them to grow up in a one-bedroom apartment. I can't speak that out loud without tears coming to my eyes. That touches my soul, right? I own six restaurants right now. I was very, very comfortable with one, doing very, very well for myself. Why did I open up more? Because now I got a team. Right? I got Ralph back there. I got Sergio. They got families now. We got to grow. They got to grow. You see how this works? You know? I don't sleep at night because I got, now I, don't, I don't even worry about Ralph anymore and Sergio because they'll, they'll fear. I worry about their kids. Your wife's got to be powerful. It's got to be able to drive you because no matter what, you can't give up. When things get tough, we need to remember why we started. Our why is gonna push us to do things we never thought we were capable. I never thought, I was at the pizza show four years ago, the first time. Four years ago, the first time, I saw a seminar by his name, uh, Doug Fairman. Anybody know Doug Fairman? He's a speaker here at the Expo. He knows Doug Fairman, right? The year after, I was sitting next to Doug Fairman in a panel. Now I'm speaking my own seminar. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than the unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination are omnipotent. Calvin Coolidge. Persistence and determination are omnipotent. This is what you guys want. Right? Anybody think it's going to be easy? If it were easy, everybody would be doing it, right? Do me a favor. Can everybody stand up real quick? Everybody stand up. The room pretty much is split up in half. Okay? All right, cool. This side of the room, sit down. Sorry. Okay. If you guys all were to go in business tomorrow, this side of the room would be out of business within two years. That's the business you guys are choosing to tackle. Hmm? 
So it's up to you guys. I'm gonna try to share what I know to help you guys through this process. I don't want you guys to be on this side of the room. I want you guys to be there. Go ahead guys, sit down. Thank you for collaborating with me. <laughs> goals, the blueprint for your dreams. Setting goals is the first step into turning the vis I'm sorry. Setting goals is the first step in turning the invisible into the visible. Tony Robbins. What are the differences between dreams and goals? Anybody? Goals are the dreams put into action. They require work, right? Goals are the actual work. They're going to get us somewhere now. Dreams are, are the what, goals are the how, how we're going to get there. Dreams are the vision, the big picture, goals are the action plan. We always want our goals to be smart goals. We want them specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Break down your dreams into smaller goals. Break down your goals into smaller objectives. If, I want to, if, I want, if my dream is to get in the best shape of my life, which is a great dream, now I need to go into goals. I need to start watching what I eat. I need to start running. I need to start doing a bunch of different things to get me to my goal. Does that make sense? Everybody follow me? Good. Strategic plans of action. What's the first thing we do in the morning when we wake? When we, what's the first thing we do in the morning? Hmm? Check Facebook. <laughs> if that's it, check out Facebook slash Pizza Coach. Um, we wake up. The first thing we do, everybody's got to wake up in the morning. So what I want you guys to do is wake up. Wake up right now. Let this be your moment. Let this be the light bulb going off. Let this be your wake up call. We need to wake up out of this dormant state that we all kind of live in sometimes, wishing and hoping, and we need to rise to action. Okay? The fight. I like to call it a fight because it is. And after this presentation, you guys will get a better understanding of it and why. And it's a never ending fight. And it can be fun sometimes, though. <laughs> very, very rewarding fight. Do you have any restaurant experience? Who does not have any restaurant experience that wants to get in the restaurant business? Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. My recommendation, if you haven't been in the restaurant business before and you're looking to open up a restaurant or get into the restaurant business, is find a job or volunteer at a restaurant. I know nothing about paint. I can't even hold a paintbrush. I'm not going to go open up a painting company or try to paint a picture for someone. This is very, very important, guys. You guys need to find a job or volunteer for a restaurant as long as you can. Take any job. If this is your dream and this is what you really want, go work at the first place that will hire you doing whatever they, they ask of you. That's how you learn, okay? You can read books. Amazon. I bought some of the best books in my life for like a dollar. You know, search Amazon. Search biographies of restaurateurs. There's plenty, plenty of stuff to find there. Online videos, behind the scene documentary. Everyone's got YouTube nowadays. Everyone's got internet on their phone, anywhere you're at. Search how to open up a restaurant, the restaurant opening for dummies. Um, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of stuff to, to look into. You can reach out to experienced restaurant owners. You would be surprised at how many will offer advice and help. This is a big one, guys. Some of my best mentors are people that I've cold called. I picked up the phone and said, listen, I'm a big fan. I've been in the restaurant business. I'm a young guy. You got some time to talk to me, give me some advice. And most of the time, they're willing to. So don't be scared to reach out to people, to share your dream, and to tell them how much you respect them, and if they're willing to sit down with you for a cup of coffee. Offer to buy them the coffee, you know, but you'd be surprised. You can hire a consultant to guide you through the process. Now, most times in startups, who's got the money for that? But this is another option. It's not a bad one if you have no restaurant experience. Something like this can help you a lot. Uh, if you're for anybody thinking of franchising, okay, good, good. Uh, mo all franchises have some type of training program. Uh, and if you'll see, you'll meet a lot of people at the expo here today too. Um, but they have different people have different programs. They put you through a proper process and, uh, and it's, they're not gonna let you open up a restaurant unless you know what you're doing. So if you have no restaurant experience, franchising is, is a really good idea as well. Okay. If you have restaurant, who's got restaurant experience that's trying to open up a, a restaurant? Okay. 
Good. Any owners in here? Any previous owners that are looking to open up a second store? Okay. All right, good. So if you do have restaurant experience, you're one leg up, right? But this is the biggest thing you guys are going to fight. Employee versus owner mentality. And it's funny, I have, I have a partner as well, and I talk to a lot of people, but this never goes into anyone's mind when they're about to open up a business. You think, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm going to open up a store, and I'm going to be able to be the boss and make my own schedule and do what I want and, and hire people to do what I don't want, right? Not how it works, guys. So up until now, as an employee, you have always gotten a paycheck, weekly, monthly, et cetera, right? Barring anything crazy. I know some people with certain companies don't get paid. They're about to shut down, whatever. But most of the time, you go to work, and then you collect a paycheck, right? Punched in and punched out. The ability to leave your work at work, right? Some people I know take with them, but most people, you punch in, you go to work, you deal with work. Once you punch out, you don't care about work no more. You don't think about it. It doesn't cross your mind again. You've not had to deal with a lot of pressure. You've followed orders and direction from superiors. Your boss tells you what to do and what not to do. You've gotten feedback and reviews from your superiors. You've passed on blame and responsibilities. Someone says, oh, this wasn't done. Oh, that's, that's Jimmy's job. That's Frank's job. It's not my job, right? You've lived in the present and made decisions based on what involved solely your work and how it affected you. I got to get my work done by this time so I can check my Facebook and play on my computer before 5 o'clock so I got to go home. As an owner, you are not guaranteed a steady and consistent flow of income. Circumstances are always changing, emergency factors and unexpected expenses arise. Broken coolers, AC stops working, heat stops working in the middle of winter. You're also the last one to get paid. Got to pay your guys, right? You don't pay them, what happens? They don't come to work. You guys have been employees, you guys didn't get paid, what happened? <laughs> Not gonna go to work, right? There's no punching in and out. You will work, your work will extend way beyond the hours you are in your store. Nowadays, I'm not in my stores a lot. Maybe, maybe 20 hours a week, I wanna say, but I've never worked as much as I work right now. Again, sometimes you don't sleep, you jump out of bed, it's always on your mind, right? You're always working on something, the next idea, the next thing. Always on the phone, always taking phone calls. Now we have emails, texts. They, everyone has a way to get a hold of you. Well, that's the difference. Um, you don't get to leave your work at work because you are ultimately responsible. Can't say, I'm punching out. Let them deal with it. No, it doesn't work that way. That's your problem. You will have a lot of pressure, guys. A lot, a lot of pressure. Not everyone's built for this pressure. Pressure to pay bills, pressure to pay your employees, the pressure to make a living, and the pressure to deliver to your customers' expectations. Any of that give anybody anxiety? Me a little bit. <laughs> but you let that fuel you. Don't, I love, don't let me scare you off either. You guys need to know all this. You guys can't jump into something blindly. And two years go by, and you blew your savings, you blew your 401k, you put a second mortgage on your house, and you ask yourself, what the hell did I just do? What happened? Um, no one to tell you if you're doing the right or wrong thing and no one to give you a pat on the back. Half the time as an owner, a small operation, you don't, you don't know if you're doing the right or wrong thing. You know, you might get lucky and get an employee you trust and you're able to confide in, but you sometimes don't know if you're doing the right or wrong thing. It's a tough place to be in. Um, no pats on the back. You can work a 15-hour day, 18-hour day. You can work 40 hours in, in three days, you know? There's no one there to say, hey, good job. You know, your employees don't care how much you work. You're crazy. No one there to give you a pat on the back. You have a great marketing idea that brings in extra people. Uh, you, you donate pizzas to a school. No one's there to give you a pat on the back. 
you got to be strong enough inside and you got to have that own, your own self-confidence. Because most of the time, no one's there to give you a pat on the back. Not the business to, to go seek a, a pat on the back for. Um, you cannot make decisions without being aware of the big picture and seeing down the road. And how your decisions affect everyone and everything. I can't make a decision for my own selfish reasons. I have to worry about my people. I have to worry about my stores. Struggles and challenges of the transition. Leadership. Leadership is the biggest, biggest, biggest challenge when you transition from employee to owner. Most people are not used to being in a leadership position. And because of that, we're not aware of what that means. Let me hear some definitions of leadership. Anybody want to share what they think leadership means? Okay. Anybody else? Taking charge. Okay. Serving your team. Being responsible. Good. Keep them coming, guys. Just yell them out. Being able to achieve a goal with the team. Let me. Can everybody see this? Okay. Sir, you, when you think of a good leader, what's one trait that comes to your mind? Strong. Strong. Part of my handwriting, guys. Sir, with the red hat, when you think of a leader, what, do you, what comes to your mind? Competent. You said co confident. Anybody else? A good listener. So empathetic, right? Cool. Someone else. Come on, guy. Yes, back there. Caring. Set an example, okay. An example I'll put. Who else? Come on. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Communicative. Communicative. Professional. Professional. What was the other one before that someone said? Motivating, Motivating. okay. I'm out of space now. Everybody see this? Yeah? Okay, let me get over here so I'm out of your way. So we talked about a leader and some traits that we think a leader must have. So a leader must be strong. A leader must be confident. A leader must be professional. A leader must be empathetic. A leader must be communicative. A leader must be caring. He must set an example. Be trustworthy and motivating. Is that right? We're on the same page? So every day, this is what you need to be. Every day, this is what we need to be. Strong, confident, professional, empathetic, communicative, caring. Set an example, trustworthy, and motivating. And if we're not, we suck. If we're not, we're not doing a good job. And when we are these things, don't expect a pat on the back either. There was a quote, I wish I know who said it, but it was, uh, oh God, I wish I knew who said it. Great quote. But the best leaders are the ones that are invisible, that no one even knows exists, right? Strong, confident, professional, empathetic, communicative, caring, be an example, be trustworthy, and motivating. And when we're not, we suck. Remember this, guys, every day. If you're going to lead an organization, And if you're going to lead a group of people, you have to be strong, confident, professional, empathetic, communicative, caring, an example, trustworthy, and motivating. Every day. Another mistake I see and a challenge is that people don't develop their own leadership style. Right? We go in as the, as, even if you're a first time manager or you're, or you're first time in a leadership position, it doesn't have to be a restaurant owner. 
All you're doing is copying a previous bad boss. Right? You had some jerk boss that knew how to push your buttons and got to you, and you think that's what a good boss should be. I see this time and time and time again, guys. Don't fall into that trap. Again, it starts with the heart. Listen to your heart. Lead with your heart. Be brave. Be courageous. Be vulnerable sometimes. It's okay. That's what a leader is. Caring. Question? As a leader on that point as well, uh, developing your own style, you need to be always constantly learning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every day. Absolutely. The more you learn, the more you earn. Warren Buffett, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ways to improve your leadership skills, guys. Serve as a role model. Work on communication. Be passionate. But like the gentleman just said, too, study leadership. If you've never been in a leadership position or you're struggling with it, study it. Just like anything else. You don't know a language, you're going to study, right? John Maxwell, I recommend. Books, audiobooks, videos. Again, you guys are on YouTube. Everyone's got YouTube, Facebook on their phone. Facebook slash Pizza Coach, that's me. Always oh, there. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, Eric Thomas is a big, uh, someone I'm a, um, a big fan of. Uh, nowadays, we have no excuse. We have all the resources in the world. Generations before us didn't have access to, to any book we could possibly want within 24 hours if you got a Prime account. YouTube. We have so many things at our disposal. We have no excuses anymore when it comes to education. You don't have to go to school for an education anymore. You can educate yourself. I'm self-educated. I never went to college. I went one time and I said, this ain't for me. Dad, put me to work. Different leadership styles, and we t I skimmed on this before, you know? There's strong, firm leaders, which that's pretty self-explanatory. Democratic leader, there's a lot of leaders that like to involve their people in every decision they make, you know? Talk to guys, what do you guys think? Let's make this decision together. There's pros and cons to each style. I'm just talking about different styles right now. I've seen parental leaders, another pro and con, where sometimes bosses, owners, Try to be more of a parent and a friend to their employees, which is great, breeds loyalty, but I've seen cons of that too. When that employee screws you or lets you down, it hurts. Man, it hurts. I've hired cousins of mine that I've found stealing in my stores. Man, that hurts. It's not the money, you would have gave them the money, right? There's servant leaders, which I, to me, my personal opinion, that's my favorite type of leadership. Sam Walton from Walmart was a servant leader. Put himself in the forefront, showing everybody the way. Now we can get to some of the more technical stuff that I'm sure a lot of you guys were waiting for, right? We have the dream. We have the idea. Now we're going to start structuring this. Are you going to be the sole owner? And what are the pros and cons? What's one of the pros about owning your own restaurant by yourself? You make all the decisions. What's one of the cons? <laughs> eh? Good. Will you have one or multiple partners? Anybody looking to partner up with somebody here in a venture? Okay. What are the pros in that? Someone help you manage, some shared responsibility, alleviate that pressure. Sharing of Pardon me? Sharing of, talent. Sharing of talents. If you guys can learn how to work together, yeah. Absolutely. Somebody else was saying something here. Sharing the financial risk. Sharing the financial risk. That's another pro. Absolutely. What are the cons? Sharing the profits. Sharing profits. What was it, sir? What was that? Can't get along. Can't. Yeah, what if you can't get along? Now what? You're stuck with that person, right? Yes. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> okay. So there's pros and cons. You got to find what works for you. If you do partner up with one or multiple people, what kind of relationship and agreement should you have? Again, my advice, don't, if you're going to partner up with your best friend or your cousin 
or your brother-in-law or whoever you're going to partner up with, make sure you guys go over with a fine tooth comb every possible scenario. Because what I've learned too at the end of the day, I'd rather lose a business partner than lose a friend or an uncle or whatever. So if me and um, one of you guys were to go in business together and we're great, great friends, from my experience, what I've seen in the business, I would say, listen, let's sit down and let's tell each other first and foremost that we're friends, right? No matter what happens. From there, I would probably seek the counsel of an attorney. And the reason I say this, guys, is because it just makes everything more real, right? We're partners, there's an attorney, let's go over what happens if this were to happen, if we were to go bankrupt, if things go well, if this decision arises, what's my responsibility, what's yours responsibility? Everything's clear, everything's on a piece of paper. Even if you never, ever, ever look at that agreement because you guys mesh your talents and work well and it's a benefit to everybody, God forbid any conflict were to arise, you just go to that paper. Say, listen, friend, this is what we agreed on, you know? This is our, our law. And then you, it's, you got a better chance of not taking things so personal, if problems will arise. In any type of partnership, though, remember, it's never just, you know, any marriage is never smooth sailing, right? There's always bumps, there's always problems. So that's another thing. Pick a partner that you guys are compatible with, you know, and go over everything in advance. Every, any possible scenario. So when something were to arise down the road, you guys already kind of ironed it out and you know what's going to happen. Um, will you have investors? Anybody looking to pick up, to, to raise some money with investors? Okay. Pros and cons of that. Pros, obviously, someone else's money. Someone else is putting up the financial risk. What are some of the cons? What was that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If they're giving you money, you bet your ass they're going to think they own you. No, especially if they're not seeing any money back. You want somebody sitting in your restaurant telling you what to do when they have no idea how to run a restaurant or they haven't been in the kitchen? Yeah. That's one of the cons. I'm not saying it's going to go that way, but it's another thing to, to be aware of. Legal entity. I am not an accountant. I'm not an attorney, but I'm just going to speak a little bit about different options you guys will have. Um, right around now is the time to register your business with the state and choose a name. It doesn't have to be the name of your restaurant. Um, for example, I could have a company that's called DDN Investments Inc. And then eventually I'll open up my pizza place. I'll call it Pat's Pizza. So I'll be doing business as DBA Pat's Pizza. Now's a good time to register um, for your legal entity with an accountant or an attorney. I think you could actually do it online. But then you have to choose, again, with counsel. I'm not a, a, an attorney or an accountant, but if you want to be a sole proprietorship, a corporation, or LLC, all three of them have different advantages and disadvantages for tax purposes. Again, you got to find what makes the most sense for you. Follow me so far? Good. Time to hire an accountant or attorney. Find, take time and find the right. Don't just hire the first guy. These people can be your best friends or your worst enemies. Find the right accountant and attorney that's going to work for you. You're partnering with them too, ultimately. We're going to name your business, right? The beginning of your brand. Try to avoid names that are too long. You don't want Rick, Bobby, Susie, and Carly's Extraordinary Pizzeria and Restaurant. Try to find something short and simple. So if it's Rick, Bobby, Susie, and Carly, let's just do Rick and Friends Pizzeria. Make sense? Big corporations spend a lot of money on names. Study some big brand names like Coke, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, Starbucks, Apple, and Target. What we want is we want something catchy, something that people, is go people are going to remember. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to go Rick, Bobby, Susie, Carly's extraordinary P3, no one's going to remember that. <coughs> I wrote this, and I've read this 20 times, and I can't even tell you what names those are. You know, you're not going to remember that. So we want something a little bit shorter, a little bit more. Uh, concise and memorable. Uh, logo. After you pick out your name, you're going to start exploring logos. Make sure you can read it. You don't want a logo that no one's going to understand or no one's going to be able to read, right? You can pick different colors. So if you want a red and black or a green and orange or a yellow and, and purple, whatever color logo you want, that's fine, but you want to make sure it looks good in black and white as well. Reason being, you guys might print t-shirts in black and white. You guys might um, 
fax something that's gonna come through black and white. So you always wanna make sure black and white resonates as well with the, with the logo. Uh, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Anybody know that saying, keep it simple, stupid? Yeah, good, it's a popular one. I, love, I like it. Um, same thing with, the, with your logo. You know, it's, it's really, really easy, especially nowadays, everybody can design their own logo, and you got Pinterest, and you got all these good looking things, but when you look at some of the more recognizable logos, whether it's Coke, Target, Apple, they're the, the simplest logos you can think of, right? What you really wanna shoot for is recognition. You don't want something that's just pretty. You want something that's recognizable. Someone's gonna drive by, see it, and instantly recognize it. Or if you're a sponsor on a shirt, sometimes we sponsor schools and there's like three, four sponsors. When someone sees our logo, they can easily identify it. That's what we want. Um, the design should match and fit the company. If you wanna be a fun young restaurant, make sure your logo is young and fun. If you want an authentic Italian restaurant, you wanna portray that look as well. Okay. Consistency, from here on out, you want to be as consistent as possible with your letterhead, fonts, and colors. So don't design, excuse me, a logo that's red, white, and green, and then your letterhead's yellow and purple. Does that make sense? Okay. Everything should match and flow, and that's including the website. Now is the time where I would look at a website. Reason why you're gonna have your name, even if you don't even have your storefront yet, you don't know where you're gonna be, you do have your name and you do have your logo, Buy the website now. Buy that web domain. Make sure you secure it so nobody else can take it. If I want Pat's Pizza, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I buy Pat's Pizza. Dot com. Um, website doesn't have to be elaborate at this point. It could just be coming soon, Pat's Pizza. And uh, what we're looking to do is secure the web address, but also start building your SEO. This is something, there's a lot of conferences on this too, guys. The game has changed a lot when it comes to websites and all this stuff. So if I were opening up in Las Vegas, I not only would buy patspizza.com, I would buy pizzalasvegas.com or lasvegaspizza.com or any other thing that anybody would search that would go in a search engine that would lead them so I could funnel them directly to my site. So if I'm in Las Vegas for a conference and I want pizza and I Google Pizza Las Vegas, whoever owns that site, you'll never know, it's funneling right to that first search that comes up. So this is really important for you guys that are in the smaller towns especially because these domains are gonna be available. You know, I own in Chicago Catering O'Hare, O'Hare Catering, and they all funnel to my different restaurants. Um, so people don't know they're even searching for my restaurants. They're just looking for catering near the airport and, we, and they kind of find us. So this is really cool, uh, elaborate stuff that we should start looking at even now, okay? Have a coming soon and an about us page. So if you do have people that are gonna be involved, if you wanna talk a little bit about yourself, now's the time to put it. Why? Because this will help if you're shopping around your idea or someone wants to look you up. So say I am looking for investors and I'm pitching my brand to the gentleman with the green shirt, all he has to do now is search me, search my restaurant, and he could see my idea. If I go to a bank searching for a loan, they could kind of go and see that I already have things in motion. I got my stuff together already. Show me the money. Business plan. Yes. We're going back? Uh, yeah, go back one. Mm -hmm. um, if I can maybe just add one more thing. Sure. Copyright. Uh, yeah. Don't check your logos and even the name of your business. Because that's the worst when you get this dream that I'm going to build up. you got seven stores now. I'm going to find out the name of your business. You already matched the copyright and trademark. <laughs> yeah. So you change it, change all your store names, change all your pictures, change everything. Yeah. Your name. That, that could be devastating. Absolutely. Again, back to the lawyer, guys. Okay? Seek legal counsel. But always do your homework, too, like the gentleman said, you know? Um, business plan. How will you be financing your project? You can self-finance. I've done that a few times. Bank loan, investors, silent investors, your mother, your father, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. Uh, SBA loan, you know, I'm not sure who's opening up a business within the next six months. How are you financing? Perfect. Good. The best rates you're going to get are an SBA loan. Anybody else? Anybody self-financing? You? Perfect. Okay. You as well. Anybody taking on investors? Okay. We want to kind of figure out how much we qualify for as well, because this is going to determine a lot of decisions we make down the road. If we qualify for a million dollars, doesn't mean we have to 
take out a million dollars, but we kind of know when we search for opportunities where we want to be. If we only qualify for 50,000, obviously we can look for something larger, right? Um, writing the business plan. So a few different reasons to write a business plan. If you're approaching a lender and investor, they're gonna to wanna to see a business plan and it better be good. Anybody that gives you money wants to know that you got your shit together. The other reason, if you, even if you're self-financing, this is gonna help you navigate the waters. It'll kinda of give you a blueprint of what you need and where to spend it. Writing a business plan takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. The ways that could help, online research, industry books and magazine research, reaching out to distributors in your area, Hiring a consultant or someone with knowledge in this area. Location, where to set up shop. Things to consider. Population. We don't want to open up a restaurant where in a three mile radius there's 50 people living, right? Or 100 people living or 200 people. I know it's common sense, but we got to think about that. Traffic and visibility is important. Safety of the area. We want to know where we're going to go into business. You come to Chicago, you want to open up a pizza place, you better think twice before you go on the south side. You know? Or at least you want to know where you're getting into. You don't want to be unaware of where you're opening up. Do your research. <clears throat> Online now we could find a lot of data, a lot of stats. Go to the local police department. Know exactly what you're getting into. And sometimes it might be worth it, but you don't want to jump into something not knowing the area and what's going on in that area. Um, competition. You know, I remember at one point with one of my restaurants, I had my 20 competitors taped on a wall and I would look at them every day. I knew exactly who was in my neighborhood. I knew exactly what they were doing. Market need. Does an area need what you're gonna offer? If you're doing Neapolitan pizza, wood burning oven pizza, and there's five people that are already doing it in your small little town, well, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. Even if you're making it better, the market doesn't need that. We really want to make sure there's a need for what we're doing. Logistics. Am I going to be able to hire people in this area? You know, you can't do everything alone. You're going to have to hire people. Is it somewhere where I can get my goods delivered? You know, is there a distributor that will bring you what you need? Or is it something you're going to have to figure out on your own? That's important. If you're an owner-operator, calculate the distance of your drive to and from work. My first restaurant, I used to have to drive an hour and 15 minutes from where I lived. So that's an hour and 15 there, an hour and 15 back. That's two and a half hours to get to and from work every day, and that's not even counting what I had to work. It's a very, very big, it's easy to say, ah, oh, it's just an hour. Well, when you drive it every day, seven days a week sometimes, that adds up, right? Right now, my office and my home is uh, 10 minutes. It's nice, I could just jump out, if I'm stressed out, go home, play with my wife and dogs, and uh, go back refreshed to work. It's a big, big, big luxury to have and something to weigh at that point. You know? And other external factors too. You know, a snow blizzard in Chicago, it took me three and a half hours once to get home from the location that we had in the city from where we used to live. So that's something to always consider. Are you purchasing property? Pros and cons. What are some of the cons of purchasing a building to put your restaurant in? Got to deal with all those headaches. That's all your problem now, you know? The other con is obviously the money. That's, that's a lot of cash that you're going to have to put up, and that's your responsibility now. The pros, though, if you're purchasing the real estate as well, is that if things don't go as planned, you can sell the business. For example, you still own the property, you can lease out the business. Or you could just sell everything, business and, uh, and building, probably at a, at a higher rate than you bought it for. Uh, purchasing the property will also help you with financing the business. This will help if you're seeking financing and you're able to buy the building as well. A bank will help you finance your actual business as well because they have the building as collateral. That's another big pro. Cons, obviously the cost in upfront cash and all the, business main, all the building maintenance is uh, on you. Um, if you're renting or leasing, we want to do our homework, market rate. Even if you're not Consider If there's a hard corner that you really, really like that's available, that's great. Talk to landlords, see what they're asking, but call around the neighborhood and see what everybody else is asking for their stuff too. Give you a lot more leverage when you're negotiating. Now, you don't want to overpay. Negotiating a lease, the landlord-tenant relationship. This is from experience. I've made this mistake. 
Six places, six leases. You are in business with your landlord. Make sure you guys are comfortable with these people if you're leasing. You guys have to deal with them all the time. And I have wonderful landlords and I have horrible landlords. You know? Lease, very, very important. Don't look over that yourself and try to get that done yourself. If you're going to invest any money, I'm going to recommend to have an attorney look that over. Me and my brother-in-law, the first restaurant I had a partner with, we were young, naive, and ambitious. We signed what we thought was a five-year lease with a five-year option. So we thought we had the option after five years to renew our lease and that it was going to go up to 3% that we initially that set forth in the contract. Landlord sold the building after three years. Two years later, new landlord calls. He says, are you going to, do you want to negotiate a lease or are you guys vacating the property? 60 days before. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? In the lease, there was a condition that we did have the option, but depending on if the landlord wanted to grant us the option, which the new landlord didn't want us to, he said, if you guys want to stay, rent is tripled. Boom. 60 days. Didn't sleep for 60 days. Right, wife? <laughs> That's one of the battles. These are the fights, guys. These are the fights. So protect yourselves. Get the attorney. Pay whatever you got to pay. Have them read all this stuff for you. You'll thank me later. Um, the story has a happy ending. We're still at that location. It was a hard, tough negotiation, you know, but we were ready to walk because, you know, three times what they were asking, it didn't make any sense. Know your landlord, you know, and do your homework if they have other properties. Um, protect yourself, obviously, with the lease. But your landlord, you are in business with your landlord no matter what. If something goes wrong, you're going to call your landlord. Times are rough. You need to they need to extend you a couple of days. You know, you, you need the right landlord that fits your personality. If you're a hothead, don't, don't go sign a lease with a hothead landlord. That's a recipe for disaster. You guys are going to kill each other. Do I want an existing space or a full build-out? Does everybody understand what this means? So you have options when you want to open up a restaurant. You could go into a space that was previously a restaurant, and they're going to have some infrastructure in place. They're going to have a hood. Um, and they might actually have equipment in some instances too. And sometimes there's nothing. It's four walls, and you have to build everything out. So the pros and cons of this is <clears throat> when something is existing in its place, most times local municipality codes and health department codes have been inspected and passed. You're going to jump a big, big, big amount of time and headaches. Depending on where you're at, some of these local municipalities, some of these um, health departments are really, really tough. Um, so there's a lot of value in a pre-existing place. The money as well, because when you go to one of the cons, I'm sorry, I jump sometimes. The con is that you were left with the previous owner what, with what the previous owner decided. And many times you're forced into conform, conforming to their design. So if they place the hood in a certain spot, you can't pick up a hood and just move it. Not that easy, you know? So you're kind of, you're kind of fitting stuff to their initial vision, their initial design. If you can make it work, great, because they're gonna save a lot, a lot of money, a lot of headaches, a lot of aggravation. <clears throat> in a full build-out, you're able to design the store as you wish with the architect and your specific needs. Be very, very careful of this too. Another store we opened up, we budgeted for $75,000 full build out. We ended up paying four times as much. So full build outs, the con is they could be very, very expensive. They're very, very time consuming. You know, it requires the help of architects. You have to work with contractors, a lot, a lot of stuff that goes into that. But again, at the end, you have the place that you want. Things are where you want them to be. You have more efficiency. Did you have a question? Oh man, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, it's a tough time. Um, the con is it becomes very expensive and time consuming and you must deal with all local inspectors, right? But not only that guys, now you're dealing with architects, contractors that are supposed to show up and they don't show up and you're calling them and they're not answering. A lot of contractors, you know, they'll start your job and they'll work on it. But if they get another call, they're gonna start another job. They, they have their own way of working, you know? So they prioritize their own jobs based on on their needs. So it's, you're just dealing with a lot more people and a lot more factors, you know? The architect might have misdrew something, so you're going through planning review, and they're calling you and saying, listen, this measurement's wrong, or you guys need to adjust this. You call the architect's office because you want to get the plan back in as soon as possible to move your project forward, and the architect doesn't get back to you for three, four days, you know? 
very, very time consuming. And if you get into a lease where you know you don't get any free rent, let's say, or they only give you two, three months free rent, sometimes you're paying rent and paying everybody else, and you're on a tight deadline, you know. So you're at these people's mercy too. A build out, I mean, a build. Obviously, the pros are you have what you want, and most of the time it it works out better. But there's a lot, lot, lot more that goes into it, you know. Um, but God bless. If money's not a factor, then yeah, do the build out, of course. Uh, a lot of first time owners, though, it is, you know. I would rather save that money and, and put it somewhere else, put that into advertising. Let's get people in the door, right? Other things to think about when inspecting a location for lease or purchase these are in no particular order kitchen and dining room flow, kitchen design. Dining room, tables, chairs, decor, etc. Electrical problems, plumbing problems, HVAC problems, kitchen, kitchen equipment, refrigeration, POS systems. You guys are at the right place. Walk up and down the expo floor. There's plenty of people trying to sell you a lot of great stuff, but you'll get a better idea of all the stuff you're gonna be looking to get into, okay? Menu. <clears throat> your menu is your restaurant. After you pick the location, you know where you're going to be, you know your name, it's time to develop your menu. You want to stay consistent with your branding identity. If you're branding yourself as an authentic Italian pizzeria, don't offer Indian food, right? Brand yourself as an Indian pizzeria, you know? That goes back to market need as well, you know? If you live in an Indian neighborhood with a high Indian population, why not? Uh, but you want to stay consistent with your branding identity. Branding has to be consistent or else you're just confusing people. Then people don't know what you are and that's what you don't want. You want people to know exactly who you are. Food cost, food cost equation. This is important when we factor in um, our menu decisions, right? We don't want to come into a, a strong, really good menu and then price it wrong. So I'm gonna give you, and most of you guys probably already know this, but if an item costs you $2 and you price it at 10, what's your food cost? 20%, right? So this is very, very important when you're developing your menu as well. You gotta be strategic in costing your menu. You know, you might have some items that you really, really want to carry, you know. Again, going back to your branding and your identity. If I'm a low-cost pizzeria, and I, I, I shouldn't be offering filet mignon, right? Doesn't make sense. Stay consistent and really, really, really price your menu and watch your numbers or else you can get in trouble. Ideal food cost varies in different industries. Again, you can be strategic. For example, you might want to run a higher food cost in hopes that consumers see the value of your product and will profit more off of more volume. So if I'm pricing at 20%, but I sell 10 pizzas versus me food costing at 50%, but I sell 100 pizzas, I'm gonna make a lot more money selling 100 pizzas at 50%. You have the flexibility to do that, but you need to be aware and strategic about it. You don't wanna just set prices because you're looking at someone else's menu. You don't know what they're using or why they're pricing that. Know exactly what something costs you, and then be strategic about your pricing from there. You gotta be aware though. Don't just go from the hip on this stuff. This stuff's very, I learned the hard way on some of this stuff. Someone asked me once years ago, what's your food cost? And I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm working in the restaurant. I'm worrying about who's gonna show up to work and get his orders up. I had no idea what my food cost was. Mm -hmm. um, in the pizza industry, you wanna be lower than 30%. In a perfect world, over 35, you're, you're probably going to be in trouble. Again, it's your business model too. This goes into your planning. Maybe you want to run a 35 or a 40 or 45% and you're like, you know what, people are going to see the value and I'm going to make it up in volume. Just be aware of what you're doing. You don't want a menu that's too small, right? You don't just want only pizzas, you want to at least offer some type of side, appetizer, soda, and desserts, minimally. Got to give something. And you don't want a menu that's too big. The larger the menu, the more inventory you have to carry, which means it's going to cost you more to carry more items. 
David Scott Peters was a very, very popular speaker at these conventions. He's not here this year. His partner is. He talks about this all the time. He wants your money in your bank account, not on your shelves. Hmm? Carry ingredients you can use in multiple ways. If you're going to bring in avocados on your menu, find different ways, different menu items to use that avocado with, not just for one thing. Avocados are expensive now, too. What's going on with them? So you want to be, because they go bad. You don't want the waste. You don't want the spoilage. So you want to find ways to rotate the inventory, okay? You want to be sensitive to some dietary restrictions. You don't have to, but nowadays you want to be sensitive to some dietary restrictions. At least be aware of them, and you can make your, your choice. Vegetarian options, gluten-free. Vegans are really, really big thing now. You guys will see at the pizza show. But I don't do anything. Uh, I don't mess with vegan cheeses, but... At one of our restaurants, the dough is, uh, is vegan. There's no um, butter eggs, so we can make a vegan pizza. Our sauce is vegan as well, but we don't bring in a vegan cheese. Again, we're not going to sell enough. A lot of, there's not that many vegans were in our neighborhoods. People were asking for it, we probably would, but they're not. You know? The gluten-free is a really, really big one. I was at a seminar here yesterday where they talked about the difference between fads and uh, trends. You know? The gluten-free is not a, uh, a fad. It's a, it's a trend. People... You know, people are allergic to gluten. People are choosing not to eat gluten anymore. That's something you really want to carry. And the vegans, I mean, the vegans, I don't know, sometimes vegans are not going to go for pizza. You know, if, if someone's a true vegan, they're, they know where to go for their stuff. There's a guy here that speaks to the convention too. I forgot his name. I was on a panel with him last year. It's not coming to my mind, but he has an only vegan pizzeria, I believe. So he found his niche. He found the right market, and he does extremely, extremely well. Uh, Scott Sale, yeah. Brilliant guy. If you guys get a chance, follow his seminar too. Um, recipes. You either have them that are passed down, they're your own recipes you developed, or again, books, YouTube, Pinterest, or you can hire a chef or consultant to develop. You need to have an actual recipe and recipe book. I don't want you guys just winging recipes. Okay, why, why, why? Consistency, what else? Training purposes, good. What was that? Cost control. All those three reasons, right? If you have a recipe and you have a recipe book and you're thinking about changing cheese and you know exactly how much cheese you're putting on a pizza, now it becomes easy to see what your price would be, how that's going to affect you short-term, long-term, right? If you want to upgrade cheese, you might have to upgrade your price. Training purposes. If that guy knows that you know, you're not just going to put whatever cheese you want on a pizza, it's going to be 16 ounces, it's really, really easy to train someone. Same thing with sauce and dough. Um, staffing. How many people are you going to need? Who's opening up a restaurant soon? How many people you need to hire? Okay. Oh, you're switching locations. Who else is opening up a restaurant? Do you know how many people you need to hire? Five. Okay, good. At least you have an idea. What jobs will they perform? I just listed some. Sometimes we're getting into the restaurant business, we don't think of certain positions. Pizza maker, chef, manager, waiter, or waitress, dishwasher, counter, phone person, delivery driver. There's probably more we could add to this as well. Be as detailed as possible and really sit, think this stuff through. Okay. How much to budget? Does anybody know how much to budget? So now I know my location. I'm figuring out my build out. I've developed my menu. I know what I'm going to price my menu at. Now I got to start building my team, my dream team, but how much can I afford? Right? We don't know. And this is another thing that's hard too when you're opening up a business. They expect you in your business plan to anticipate sales. There is no, if someone could prove me wrong, tell me. There is no way you're going to know on day one what the hell you're going to ring up. So I've always worked three, four different equations, and it's always I start with worst case scenario, and then I start with pretty bad, and then okay, and then, you know, and obviously best case. But you kind of have to be prepared for all those scenarios so that you can quickly adjust. Um, how much to budget? This is really, really hard in the beginning, probably impossible until you get open for, for some time. But 
Small owner operators should stay as low as possible and strive for 20%. Doesn't mean you're gonna hit it, but strive for that. 30%, including managers, we start getting into the danger zone, right? You start running 35, 36, 37 on labor, it's gonna be tough. And I'm even 30 sometimes, depending on what your other margins are. So obviously you get into, you know, that month, you start, you get right in between 20 and 30, 25%, you're gonna be okay. 20 or lower, you're golden, you know? 30, you gotta start being careful. As an owner operator, you will be the centerpiece of your team, right? We talked about leadership, we talked about what's gonna be expected of you. You need to staff your weaknesses. One of the first things when I was uh, 18 years old and I was running my first restaurant for my dad, I didn't like to wake up in the morning. Plus, I had that hour and 15 minute drive, like I told you guys. So I knew that I needed somebody that was an early riser that would be there 9, 10 o'clock to get that place open. That's a very, very simple explanation, but you guys need to think like that as well. Staff your weaknesses, right? If you're a chef, hire someone, a front of the house person. If you're an introvert, hire people with outgoing personalities. We're in the restaurant business, hospitality business. People like to talk. I'm not a big talker one-on-one. -on -one. My wife is, so we work well together, you know? Um, if you have no experience running a restaurant, hire someone who does. Put yourself in a position to succeed. Attract, retain, and multiply talent. This is not an easy one, but this is something with time you're gonna have to learn how to do. Attract talent, right? When you find the right people and the good people, you wanna maintain. And if they're good and then you're good, what's gonna happen is you're gonna multiply. And if you're lucky, one day you have the dream team, right? And you're just breeding champions and you're turning them in and out. And you're not worried if somebody leaves or if somebody quits or if somebody doesn't show up because you got other people just ready to step up. Anybody a football fan? Patriots, next man up, right? They never miss a beat no matter what. Getting accustomed to working with millennials. This is not my opinion. This is their reputation. They act selfishly, they want special privileges, they break rules, they demand higher pay, and they're entitled and lazy. <laughs> Anybody have an opinion they want to share? <laughs> Again, this is the, does anybody agree with this? Disagree with this? Okay. Well, one thing we could all agree on is that they're different. The mentality is different. People is different. This world is different now. So, back to back to what we need to be every day or we suck. We need to be professional, empathetic, caring, and very, very, very communicative with this newer generation of workers. Because when I was young, growing up, and I, I only worked for one or two people, um, it wasn't for me, and, um, but when I was told to do something, I did it, you know? And I was 14 years old, busting tables, you know, they told me to go run through a wall, I ran through the wall, you know, I asked questions later. This generation is a lot different. Don't expect to tell them to do something without explaining why. Doesn't work like that with them. <laughs> You're laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I apologize to my generation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's just uh, things are different, you know. You know. You know. <laughs> not all of them. Not all of them. Some of my rock stars are millennials. So, not all of them. It's um, again, a lot of them can fall into light light into this reputation. But you need to over communicate with millennials. And for me, it's, it's hard. Oh, it's hard. If I tell you to go wipe the table, just wipe the damn table. Don't ask me why, right? You know? Answer the phone on the second ring, why? What do you mean, why? You know, so, yeah. yeah. It's Friday night and they call you, oh, I can't work tomorrow. What do you mean you can't work tomorrow? Saturday night. Well, I got stuff to do. Oh, you have stuff to do, okay. This generation is, you know, it's different. It's very, very different. So for someone older that's never, you know, you're going to deal with millennials if you're in the restaurant business. So this is something to, to anticipate and to prepare for.
Again, they're not all like this though. I, I, some of my best people are millennials, hard workers. Um, they listen and they don't fall under any of these um, categories right here. The opening, all right? So now we staffed, we trained, we have our menu. How are we doing on time? Anybody know the time? Okay. Um, before you open, you wanna make sure that you are fine-tuned in front and back of the house, right? We don't wanna open the doors if we have no idea what we're doing yet. We don't have our recipes set down, we don't have our presentation of food. Uh, we're just gonna shoot ourselves in the, foot, in the foot. Work out kinks with equipment and make sure you, ta uh, you taste test everything on the menu. And you don't want to serve something that you don't know what it, what it tastes like. You don't want to open up and not know how your oven works, depending on what oven you're using too, you know. Every oven's different. You're going to have hot spots. You got to test your product. Uh, make sure you have, inspect presentation and quality. This is very, very important, right? Make sure you have a full inventory of food and supplies. You don't want to open up and somebody calls and asks for mushrooms on their pizza and you don't have them, you know. You don't have enough. That's why even your, your first purchase, your first inventory purchase is always going to be your highest. You know? And I've never budgeted that right either. You know, I typically allocate, you know, let's just throw out $10,000 in my initial inventory purchase and it's usually double. So if you're budgeting, allocate a lot of money for your initial inventory purchase. If you get good terms with the vendor, 14 days, that'll help a little bit. Sometimes you can't. So again, back to your business plan. That's something you guys want to plan for. Allocate a lot of money because you don't want to have an inventory when you open up. You want to be stocked and ready to, ready to rock and roll, right? Because we're hoping, best case, that people just keep on coming in and, you know, and we're rocking and rolling. Do not have a grand opening until all kinks are worked out. Right? You don't want to advertise and get all these people in and then it's a disaster. Do a soft opening first, open up the doors. Literally, I've done this sometimes. We're not even playing, we're just taste testing, you know what? We feel good about it, open up the doors, put the open sign. If anybody walks in, you know, uh, we'll serve pizza. Sometimes we don't even charge, okay? Uh, ease into the, op I'm sorry, do a soft opening first, send out pizzas to local fire departments, police stations, schools, churches, okay? So now you can get some feedback on your product too if you're working out the last kinks. Ease into the operation and consider this time practice. It will cost you in labor and expenses, but you need to do this in order to get things right. Overstaff. If you think you're only going to need five people on your opening night, schedule 10. If you think your inventory should only be 10,000, order 15,000, right? We have to think long term. We can't be narrow-minded in this. This is our business, this is our baby, this is our dream. We're not fighting for today, we're fighting for down the road. We wanna avoid having a grand opening, getting slammed and everything going wrong. We only get one shot at first impression, so we need to be ready. Back to these decisions, I talked about this, the owner, I'm sorry, the employee and the owner mentality where that changes and how your decision-making changes. This goes back to decisions like this as well, and to the menu costing, right? If you're doing great with the product, let's say a mozzarella, you're using a grande mozzarella, and you figure out, man, I could save on food cost by switching to one of these cheaper kinds of cheese, and so you plug in a different cheese because you're trying to make more money for today or for tomorrow, I guarantee you, you're gonna lose sales over time. The consumer is not stupid, guys. You're not gonna fool these people. People are educated. People know when something's different. Your grand opening, this is, these are from my mistakes. I've done these mistakes. There's not a lot of money, you know what? I'm not gonna schedule that many people, I'm gonna figure it out. I've shot myself in the foot, I've had some bad grand openings that have hurt us too, right? So I want you to think of things in terms of when you make decisions. Most of you guys are probably gonna sign a lease of five years, I would say. Does that sound about right? You know, probably with, you know, if you're smart, do like a two and a half, three year with an option to extend. That way, if things don't go as you plan, you have three years, three years go by pretty quick. So, this is one foot, this is two feet, three, four, five feet right here, 60 inches. 
All right, everybody see that? 60 inches, that's 60 months. So when you make decisions, and when you're looking at things, a different perspective, you know, don't make that decision that's gonna help you on this day, but that might affect you down that road. Right? We gotta think about all this. We're not in this just for tomorrow. I know nobody's in this just for tomorrow. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have woke up at 9 a.m. in Las Vegas to come see this seminar. Right? It's a lot of other more fun things to do in Las Vegas than sit here at 9 a.m. Right? So remember this. This is a powerful visual tool, you know? If things are getting rough in month six and you're getting your ass kicked, which you probably will be in month six, just remember, this is month six, guys. It's got a long time to go here. And this is on a five-year plan. Some of you guys might have a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan. So keep things in perspective. The security at the airport asked me why I had a tape measure in my pocket. Um, where were we? Grand opening. So promote, 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 right? You could have the greatest product. You could have the greatest service. You could be doing something that nobody's doing, but if you don't get that word out, no one's going to know about it, right? Like I said, if you have, if you're playing with money and budgeting in the beginning, try to save as much money as possible in advertising. That's another piece of advice I'd give you. Get that voice out there. Once you're fine-tuned and you're confident and you're ready to go and you worked out some kinks, get that voice out there. Promote, promote, promote. Call up local municipalities and invite everyone over, right? Call the mayor. Call the trustees, call the local churches, call the pastors. Have a big party, get everybody in there. Visit all the businesses in the neighborhood, introduce yourself and pass out flyers. This is a lot easier if you live in a small neighborhood. In a big city, it might be a little bit harder, but reach out into the local community. Try to be a part of that community. That's another thing I struggled with for a long time. Again, I'm, it doesn't seem like it, I'm speaking to you guys, but I'm more of an introverted person. I'm a worker, I'm a grinder. And also, it's not my nature to reach out and to call people and uh, to go shake hands with the mayor, but yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, build that anticipation. Yeah. Coming soon website. Get your social media pages up. And actually, great idea. Some I don't think we ever did it, but somebody else too. You could even a countdown, which is going to be hard. You'll see when you're. It's, it's, it's hard to plan a countdown. Well, towards the end, you'll have an idea, but it still depends on a lot of things. Um, but you can even track your progress through social media now, you know? Build a following, you know, this is our new oven, this is what our dining room looks like, and kind of build that anticipation with everybody too. Yeah. 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 We'll talk about this in a little bit. I want to try to get through this so we can have uh, time to discuss some of this stuff. Um, anticipate a boom in your first three months. So you're going to open, have a good grand opening. Things are going to go very, very well for three months, right? And then probably what happens is you're going to work on those percentages, your labor, and then after three months, you're going to dip. <laughs> so anticipate that dip. So if you're used to doing, I don't know, I'm just throwing out numbers, guys, $10,000 a week, in my opinion, after that three months, you're probably going to do 75 a week. Anticipate that dip. That's very, very common with, uh, with new businesses. That is when the real work starts and the roller coaster of the fight, as I like to call it, really begins. Because you're going to plateau, you're going to see where you're at. All right? Well, that's when you start... You can, but now you're building. Now you're going to start building your business, you know? Your honeymoon period's over. Everyone that's wanted to try you because you built the anticipation has tried you, you know? Now you're going to gain customers. Some people aren't going to stay, though. They're going to move on to their old place, or they're going to find a new place. Yeah. So after three months, you're going to have a more realistic idea of kind of where your number's at, where your business is at, all right? You are now a business owner. Step in the ring. Some of my advice to you guys, consistency in everything you do, your product, your service, Cleanliness. 
Some of the challenges, how to make others work the way you want them to. Talked about this. All we can do is just be good leaders every day. You're not going to be able to make anyone do what you want them to do. Put that in your mind too. No one is ever going to care as much as you. Why would they? Not their job. Again, we're switching that employee to owner mentality. So we've all been employees. Has anyone, can anybody say with a clear conscience that when they were an employee, they cared as much as the owner about a business? Why would you? Right? So know that. Know that they're not going to care as much as you. They're not going to see what you're seeing. Right? All we can do is that right there every day. And hopefully we breed champions. Uh, keep your ego in check. It's another big thing you guys got to learn. It's so hard. It's so hard. What do you mean? I'm the owner and you're telling me you're not coming in on a Saturday night? You know? It's hard. <laughs> yeah. It happens, you know? Um, again, you have to keep your ego in check because why? We're in it for the long run, right? You know, sometimes you might want to get rid of somebody, but you can't right now. You might have to wait a little bit, you know? If they're hurting your business, you have to right away, obviously. But the decision-making process is not that simple. There's a lot of different factors when you're a small owner-operator. Uh, what else? Working with spouses, family, partners, and investors. I don't have time to really cover this. This is probably its own seminar. Um, I work with my, my wife first and foremost. She's my ultimate partner in everything that we do. And then family, my brother-in-law. I, I have some cousins that work for me. I've worked with my father before, my brother before, my mother before. Um, one thing I could say about this, this can be number D, either the best thing or the worst thing. Okay? I've had my highest highs with family and my lowest lows with family. Like I said, it's a heartbreaking business to begin with. When it's your family, you know, it hurts even more. So what I would recommend with this is be an extra communicative. Like I said, with partnerships in general, laying everything out. I know the Fairleys that run seminars here too, they, have a, they ha used to have a family conference, but um, the patriarch of the family, he has a working contract with all of his family members. He hires, I think, like 20 of them, but they all have working contracts. They, none of them have special privileges. He has them sign a contract. They're bound to it as long as they work for his company. And sometimes it's the best thing, and it kind of, just kind of keeps lines clear when it comes to, um, to business. Cash flow, sales, and expense projections. Again, anything we do before is just something to kind of help us project. We're probably going to be wrong. None of us are... There's no way you're possibly going to know. You know, I've opened up my first restaurant, which it was, I opened up the restaurant. It wasn't mine. Then I purchased it from my father. The first day we opened up, we rang up $40. How can you project that? <laughs> you know? Now, that's my highest grossing restaurant, by the way, right now. So it's really, really hard to project, but you have to inform yourself, do some, do some work, and come up with different scenarios. Once you hit that three mar the three-month mark, you're going to have a very, very good idea of where you stand. You know, and It doesn't mean you're going to stay there. You could definitely build, and your business can explode times 10, times 20, but you'll have an idea of organically where your business is, and then you start building. Um, online reputation now is a big thing. Yelp, Google, Facebook, and any other way they want to bash you, you know? Customers take their food serious and personal. You mess up their sandwich, it's like you killed their kid. <laughs> no? <Yeah. laughs> I wish I had a solution. All you can do is try to reach out to the customers. Apologize when things don't go perfect because they're never going to go perfect, you know. But some people are out for blood. I'm telling you, I'm warning you. And it's hard because as a small business owner, when you own your own restaurant, everything is personal to you. You put your blood, your sweat, your tears into that. There's no way for you not to take that personal, you know? But again, it's going to go back to ego. We really got to work on that ego, controlling our ego and not taking things personal, whether it's with our customers, our employees, and even with our spouses and family sometimes. Um, day in the life of the restaurant owner. Oh, this is a good one. I'm going to... How much time we have left? 10.34. Okay, 10.34. I'm going to stop with my presentation then. Oh, I can't. All right.
work out a worst case scenario. Sorry, guys. I told you I'm not good with this stuff. Uh, work out a worst case scenario. Right? You want an exit plan. Sometimes it's, it might happen that things just don't work out. What if? Have it. And I pray to God that it never happens with anybody in this room, you know, but sometimes it happens and it's not your fault. Have a worst case scenario, have a bailout plan just in case. Remember why you started. Write it down on a piece of paper, your iPhone, or ingrain it in your mind. But remember why you started for when times get rough. Because like I said, times are going to get rough. You guys are doing big, big things now. You guys are going to be business owners. You guys have the balls to walk into that ring. That's an accomplishment in itself. Right? It's the best feeling to walk into a place that's yours. Write it down on a piece of paper. Why? Howard Schultz. Who's familiar with Howard Schultz? Good, right? Starbucks. Who's familiar with Starbucks? Everybody knows Starbucks. You can't walk down the damn street without seeing a Starbucks. Even the convention center has a Starbucks. Does anybody know Howard Schultz's why? Anybody study Howard Schultz? You guys got to get educated on this stuff. You guys have to read biographies, do research of people that have succeeded and what they've done. Howard Schultz, people might just think, oh, the guy wanted to make money, or maybe he was just very, very passionate about coffee. Both of things which are true. Howard Schultz grew up in New York in a very, very rough neighborhood, poor. I think he had two or three siblings, I'm not sure. Grew up very, very poor in New York. His father, when Howard Schultz was seven years old, had a low paying job, broke his leg in half. Broke his leg in half, did not have health insurance. Instantly his family went from poor to I don't even know what's before poor. He tells stories about sleeping in a bathtub, right? His mission in life was to create a company where his employees did not have to worry about health insurance. That's what he wanted. That's what, what his why was. That's how personal shit has to get, guys. Right? It has to bring tears to your eyes and it has to touch your soul. If it's that strong and you're persistent enough, like we talked about, and you work your ass off, it'll always be worth it. It'll always be worth it. And I, most of the times, the, the outcome's going to be positive. Write down your dream and your goals and your objectives. Write them down. Have them somewhere. Add to them, adjust them, update them, and replace them. But keep them somewhere near and dear and review them as much as possible. Once a month, once a week, don't forget your dream and don't forget your why. Don't be one of these people that just kind of grazes through life. Just sitting there waiting to die. Who wants to do that, right? Know what you're here for, know why you're here, and every day wake up, work to get closer and closer and closer to that goal. Because even if you don't get there, you're going you're gonna to be on a crazy, crazy, crazy rewarding journey, okay? Promise me and promise yourself that you're going to give it your all. Promise me, promise yourself that you're going to give it your all and that you're all in. Do not sell yourself short. The problem is half you guys don't even know you. You know? Does that make sense? I know that some people won't, but half you guys do not even know you. I told you I grew up in a one-bedroom apartment. I don't even know where my dad got money to fly us all back to America. My father started from zero in America. We live in the greatest country in the world where anyone could be anything. He came over, three kids, fourth on the way, without a penny in his pocket, and he now owns 10 restaurants. Started at the age of 40-something. You guys don't even know you. You don't know what's inside. That's the problem. Believe in yourselves. Believe in your dreams. Believe in your heart. And work your ass off every day. Don't ever give up. I'm done with my presentation. Give me one minute and we'll do a Q&A, okay? Okay. Questions? Anybody have questions? No? Yes.
Um, I do it, you know what I mean? But like I said, I'm not more, I'm not a, that technical of a guy, you know? I think I kind of focus on these things and focus on leading, you know? Um, I get why a lot of people look at those things and, and they're not, I'm not diminishing the science of numbers and, and analytics and all these things, but I'm just a firm believer in get your ass up in the morning, go to work, do the right things, and everything else will follow. However, having said that, especially these bigger businesses, those analytics, those little things, that data is so important because that can be millions and millions of dollars over a year. I would, I would start with, you know, year over year, looking at month over month, kind of see what you're doing, see what, see what you're selling as well, you know, what's working, what's not working, and being able to project that way. Um, careful with it week over week. Sometimes, you know, holidays fall, like Easter, Sunday falls on different things, so you always got to be aware of that. Uh, back in the day, my father used to have a notebook before POS system. So what he would do is every day he would have the date and he would write little notes. Like today, you know, January 15th, bad snowstorm. And then he would have his numbers for the day, how many deliveries. So then when you kind of go back, you have an understanding of the weather trends. We're from Chicago and stuff. But um, when it comes to, you know, analytics and, and some of the other, other things you're talking about, I'm not the, the expert and I don't really jump into that stuff so much. But there are a lot, a lot of people here that, that can help you with that. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, guys, the SBA is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, organization. Um, now, we were talking about loans. I didn't have time to break down different loans because I've been involved with a lot of them. So, obviously, you can go to traditional bank, investors. The best type of loan, if you can get it, is an SBA loan, the Small, Small Business uh, Association. Uh, they're a government-owned agency. You know, they offered my SBA loan that we got... Um, one of our stores, I think our rate was like 5.99%, which a bank probably will never give you on a business. This was in, what year was it? When was Halstead? Yeah, we opened three years ago with the loan. So about four or five years ago, you know? So the SBA is always gonna be your cheapest route. It's the government, they're, you know, you're, you're providing jobs, uh, they're willing to assist you. They have so many resources. I've never taken full advantage of all of them. It is a lot more time consuming than a bank loan. They make you jump through hoops and do backflips. There's an incredible amount of paperwork, but if you're able to get a loan through the SBA, you're gonna save so much money uh, down the road. They're all government-backed loans as well. So um, you're dealing with the government and uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Very cool. Thank you for that. Yes? As you've opened one restaurant to six, mm -hmm. has your projections gotten better or more accurate as you've gone along? Or is it always yes. Yeah, no, they, they have. Um, again, with me too, it's being in the restaurant. Again, I have six of my own. I helped my father open up a certain amount. My uncle's in the restaurant business. So I've been involved with like 25 openings altogether to this day. And I know Chicago very, very, very well, different neighborhoods, trends distributors so there's a lot of people a lot of information for me to gather so in chicago i'm actually i've been pretty really dead on on our last three projections but you know number two and number three no <laughs> yes uh yeah the third part okay so we have some locations that are downtown uh, close to downtown Chicago, and uh, un, you know, un, we literally have like five or six tablets on the wall. It's crazy when you walk in there. There's so many third parties. There's Grubhub, DoorDash. Uh, I don't even know the names of the restaurant. There's a lot, and this is a big, big, big issue now with the small independent restaurants. Is this third party delivery? One thing I can tell you, one pro of some of these companies is that they take away your driver liability. 
you know? So if I'm a small pizza place and I don't offer delivery, then I am going to opt into this third party delivery right away because I don't have to hire drivers. They're going to take their commission, but they're going to pick up the food. I could still do what I do. Um, but these companies are getting worse and worse and worse in what they're, what they're taking. You know, Uber Eats wants to start negotiating at 30, 35%. That's crazy when you're dealing with these tight margins. And it's, you know what I mean? So you have decisions to make. It's funny you said that too. I'm glad you guys are here. You guys need to go to as many seminars as possible. Like I told you guys, don't come to Vegas to play. Not for this. Like come to win. You know, I was at a seminar yesterday. I'm going to be at a seminar in the middle of this. And we're conducting a seminar, my wife and I, tonight on couples in the business that you guys come, come join. But absorb as much as you possibly can because yesterday there was a panel with, they called it a longevity panel. There was three restaurateurs that have been in the pizza business for over 30 years. And this argument came up with the third party deliveries, how they are all dealing with the third party deliveries and how they're all contemplating jumping off of it. Because ultimately, people make the argument that a Grubhub customer is a Grubhub customer. They're not your customer. you know. And then Grubhub doesn't even release your information. So you can't even really market to that customer. So if someone comes to my website and places an online order, I own their email address. I could build their email list through that email address. Grubhub doesn't release that. They own that email address. They market to that customer. And then if anybody use Grubhub here? Okay, if you use Grubhub, you're pretty loyal to Grubhub. It stores your card information. You know, you're just gonna go on Grubhub, surf on Grubhub for, for whatever you want. You know, so the argument with restaurateurs now is, well, I'm gonna get rid of these third parties that are taking 30% of of the sales and I might lose a few customers that are not even my customers, but my margins will be better. And if somebody really wants to come to me, well then they'll call me or they'll go to my website. That's the argument. There's so much business that we do in the downtown Chicago on these third party delivery services that and my partner, my brother-in-law and my wife, we're kind of a little scared to just jump off that bandwagon right now. You know, we don't know how that would affect us. So um, I don't have the answer, but if this is something you know, if you would have said three, four years ago, third-party delivery services, I would have said, this is crazy. It's a fad and you don't have to worry about it. But this is something really, really real that's affecting a lot, a lot of businesses, you know. And then you have the heavy discounters, the Groupons as well. There's the argument, uh, you know, is it worth it to, to go with Groupon? Um, I don't have the answers, but it's definitely, these are, uh, these are big things right now that affect the industry. Anybody else? Are you raising your hand or playing with your hair? <laughs> okay. Do you, have, <laughs> do you have full service restaurants, giant chain trailer and deliveries? Yeah. Um, they're not big. The largest one is uh, 100 seats. And then um, the smallest one is uh, takeout. There's like four or five. Uh, oh, there's, I'm sorry, two tables and four bar stools. So they kind of range in size. Not, they're, not, they're all a little bit different. Some serve alcohol, some don't. Not full bars, though. We only have um, beer and wine. How do you decide when and how to See, I have a problem, you know. <laughs> when do you decide when and how to open up your next door? I get myself in trouble because I'm an, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a fighter, you know. So um, if it were up, you know, I wake up some days and I want to be the next Howard Schultz. I want to open up, you know, 1,000 places, 10,000 places. I want to go national. And some days I say, there's a child in the room, no? Some days I say, some days I say you know, I'm going to sell everything, that's it. So I have that entrepreneurial bug in me, though. So my instinct is to always keep going, keep pushing, open, open up more stores. Very, very important that I have my wife, my partner, kind of hold me back a little bit sometimes because uh, I, I could really, really, really get us in trouble sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just in my nature. I don't know why. You know, I have another restaurant tour friend. He's on his third location, and he reached out to me for some help, and he was expressing like his concerns. And I said, "Yeah, Nick, you you got the disease. I like to call it. You know, you're never going to be happy. You're always going to want to open more, but you you got to learn how to balance that if you don't want those headaches and everything that entails that pressure and that risk. You know, you can do one, two stores maybe on your own self finance, but eventually when you're going to grow, you're going to have to." to reach out for, for loans and, and different things. And it comes a lot of pressure with that too. Yes, ma'am. Uh, five of them are. Five of them, they're Bachi Pizzeria, which is uh, a concept that my uncle started in 1996. Um, we're not a franchise. We're just a small family independent chain. So we own five of those stores. 
And then we own another concept, which is called Uncle Pete's Pizza in uh, a Chicago suburb. So they're a little bit different. And then we do caterings to a, it's a catering company, but we work throughout of all of our kitchens. Did I finish your question? You said something else. I'm sorry. Oh, I listen to my heart, like I told you guys. And again, I listen to my heart. I follow my heart. I don't start with here, which maybe I should when you get to this point. But had I started with this, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. I wouldn't be on this stage. So I've always listened to this. So I kind of, now we've kind of developed our process. I start with here. <laughs> I talk to the boss. You know? And then uh, that's, that's kind of our process. Everybody, again, you, everyone has to develop their own process. You know, Most rest restaurateurs will tell you, if you have one strong, because they were talking about this yesterday too in a seminar. It doesn't mean you're going to make more money if you have more restaurants. I made a lot more money with one store than I do with six. But I kept on going because I have other people involved. You know, I have other managers. I have other, I call them family members. You know, I need to provide opportunities for them too. And it would have been just selfish of me just to sit with, with one place and do what I did. So that, that's why, you know, but there's not like a, not a mathematical equations, you know. Most people tell you if you have one store, it runs strong, it makes money, and you could walk away from it, then you're probably in a position to open up your second. That's what a lot of experts will tell you. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you were talking about four times the startup cost of revenue. Yeah. And uh, hmm. how much of it was foreseeable to sit out with an app correctly, or was it driven on the top? Well, uh, well, ultimately, as a business owner, everything's your fault. Remember what I told you? Everything begins and ends with you. So I must have done something wrong along the way, but there's also unforeseeable things. You know, if, um, what was the biggest cost problem there? I, there's so, again, every day there's something, so sometimes you don't remember things accurately. Um, but on Halstead, Lincoln Park in uh, Chicago, one of the biggest things was the time. You know, we negotiated what we thought was, a, and it's a high lease there because you're in a very, very prime location in Chicago, a hard corner. So we had, I believe it was four months free rent. And then between architecture, dealing with the city of Chicago, then we had the holiday season. So it was hard for people to get out. Inspections came, measurements were wrong. We had to resubmit design. They wanted things moved. Um, the cold, the weather, you know, so we ended up, um, Luckily, the landlord gave us another two months, but you know, when you're paying six, seven, eight thousand dollars rent, you know, and you went almost a year over you were supposed to go, you know, that's sixty thousand dollars right there. That's one of the things, you know, that you don't budget for. So there's always going to be something. Um, so it, if you guys are budgeting, even with a business plan, build in a contingency at least for twenty percent. Sometimes I'll see like you know ten percent, five. Build in twenty percent if you go on their budget, great. You know, it's always, I'd rather have a lot more ammo, I'd rather go to war with a lot more bullets than not enough, right? Yeah. Questions? Nobody else? Sure? All right, well, if you see me walk around, you got a question, just reach out to me. Thank you guys so much for coming. Enjoy the expo and attend as much stuff as you can, okay?